something you learned when you were born an entrepreneur? You got to start small. I have not allowed being a woman to hold me back. Credibility is not just making money, it's about making sure that you know people trust what you're doing. Law practice is not only about going to court, it's about advice. It's very difficult to, to hire somebody who's not motivated and then make them motivated. But one of the things that I'm known for is integrity. They have to see you as a person of integrity. It was the right. <laughs>Welcome to the Executive Lounge with me in Shira Addo. This is the Business Thought Leadership Program that brings you all the nuggets uh, of insights from the life and work experiences of men and women who have either built their own businesses, managed businesses, or just uh, grown institutions across the country and around the world. How often do you see a mad duck in your life? My guest today is the mad duck. Well, never mind, it's not uh, a duck per se, but this is a personality that calls herself the Mad Duck and uh, publisher of A Dinner Date with the Mad Duck. We get to meet a woman who has this audacious desire and dream to travel across all the nations of the world. At the moment, there are more than 190 of those nations recognized by the United Nations, and she's been to 73 of them. We're going to learn the lessons that she's seen across those journeys, where the differences are in our humanity and that of the rest of the world. Welcome to the Executive Lounge, Princess Umu Hatia Mahama. Thank you very much, Inshirado. It's an honor AKA to the be here. Mad Duck. Eh? Oh, yes, the <laughs> Mad Duck. But how did you come by? <laughs> I mean, of all the things, the monikers you could choose for yourself, you decided to call yourself the Mad Duck. You know, um, 11 years ago, I began this uh, odyssey. I was, I was actually traveling uh, in West Africa at the time. I was traveling from Ghana all the way to Morocco. Um, so I started writing about the things I had seen and the things I had learned um, and just wondering what title to give the book. Uh, it just came to me. I think uh, one thing that also came to me was the wild duck or the mad duck. And I thought the mad duck was, you know, really would get heads turning. Mm -hmm. Maybe that's why I, I, I stuck with the mad okay. duck. Okay. Well, I mean, it's, it's a very interesting thing because ducks, as we know them, are quite docile. Exactly. And, yeah, so. and I, you know, and that's, that's the point I'm trying to make that if you truly want to live your best life, mm -hmm. uh, you have to be, you have to be mad because ducks, like you're saying, are docile. They mm -hmm. just swim and quack. Uh, but this duck does all sorts of crazy things, you know, jumping off mountains, uh, I mean, all sorts of mad things. Wow. Now, it's quite interesting that you said 11 years ago, you started this odyssey. Mm -hmm. And indeed, it is an odyssey. I mean, to want to travel, to all the nations of the world. What was the inspiration? I mean, you could have chosen to rewrite the code that uh, holds the internet together or discover gravity. I mean, you could have done many different things, but you chose to travel. Why? Geography has always been my favorite subject. And when I was in school, uh, my geography teacher, uh, Mrs. Osudak, who I attended St. Mary's um, Secondary School in Kolegono, <laughs> she taught us the subject uh, with such passion and it came so much alive to me. Um, I remember a particular lesson where she, we, we were studying about hydroelectric electricity mm -hmm. and she taught us about the Yangtze uh, River in China and of course at that time China was a distant land China was not part of the WTO so it was not you know very popular like it is uh, today mm -hmm. um, so that just got me thinking you know how would China be um, and in my teenage years, I also started to read about adventures of the past, um, like Marco Polo, um, Ibn Battuta. Ibn Battuta was the first African explorer. Mm -hmm. um, he traveled from Morocco all uh, through to China, I think. And people like Vasco da Gama, mm -hmm. all in geography. Um, so somehow I, 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 I said to myself that when I grow up, um, I want to be a modern adventurer. The only thing is, you know, all the countries had been discovered, so I was not going to be like a Vasco da Gama. But that still didn't deter me because I still knew there were so many other things to see um, and so many stories to bring back from my travels. Now, I am very excited about what you just recounted. Um, believe it or not, I sat under the tutoring of the same geography teacher. 
Did you? Yes, and um, my fondest memories of the things I learned about, I mean, for example, the formation of rocks, the formation of them, and one of the things that she taught me, and she made it very relatable. How important was, you know, when, for example, teaching us about mm -hmm. how Barkans are formed. Mm -hmm. And, of course, Kolegono is very close to the Kole, <laughs> and so there was a very ready example of what a Barkan is. Yes. And we tend to learn these things and they're dis, you know, d detached from the reality mm -hmm. that we live. Mm -hmm. How important do you think that uh, the kind of teaching you received in geography impacted on your desire to want to see all these distant lands and experience the various cultures that she talked about? You know, I think it was really important because she taught with such passion. Uh, I mean, she was really passionate. And I think that it was something that possibly innate inside of me. I was just curious to see, uh, or to, you know, to see how China is, or how you know, the Chinese uh, look like, how they live. Um, so passion, you know, her passionate way of teaching me, and that innate desire just clicked and gave me that, uh, that you know, big dream. But when I was much younger, you know, it was a dream I had. Um, you know, it, it looked way, way out of reality because, mm -hmm. you know, there were not modern explorers that I had, um, I had seen or known. Um, but when I, you know, in my early adult life, I, I started to read books by modern explorers. A typical example is a guy called Jim Rogers. Mm -hmm. Now, Jim Rogers holds so many different records when it comes to travel around the world. The first time he traveled around the world, he went on a motorbike <laughs> and visited um, quite a number of countries, maybe 80 countries for two and a half straight years, wow. um, and wrote a great book, uh, which I read, Investment Biker. So that also informed uh, my decision. And he, tra he went around the world the second time time um, in a bright yellow Mercedes Benz um, this one you know he, he was on for uh, he, he traveled for more than four years wow. and he actually clocked the world record for you know being in one single vehicle and going around to so many countries so reading about his stories really really um, increased that curiosity to want to actually do it hmm. we're gonna come to a point where I'd like to get your thoughts about you know, education, the way we are taught today compared mm -hmm. to the kind of teaching you received which mm -hmm. inspired mm -hmm. you becoming the Mad Duck. Mm -hmm. But let's go into your travels. Mm -hmm. 11 years ago was when you actually did start this. So between school and then, what did you do and how did you nurture this inner desire over that period before you sojourned, uh, started this started. Uh, odyssey? Um, like anything else I do, I, I'm a thorough planner. Um, I first got so many books, like I, I just gave an example, and I read them. And then I got maps. And um, thankfully, with, a, you know, with the internet, it was even much easier to know, you know how people lived in other parts or how I could move from one point uh, to, the, to the next. So mm -hmm. that's basically what I did. I, I, be, I imagined or envisaged the dream in my heart, learning all these things for quite a number of years before I actually started. Let's get into your family a mm -hmm. little bit. Mm -hmm. um, you've been nurturing this. Did you get any encouragement? How did the family take the idea of you traveling at months at a time and going to distant and strange lands. I think, uh, to be honest, I've always been rebellious. Uh, <laughs> I've always been an out-of-the-box uh, thinker. Mm -hmm. um, I'll say my parents, um, you know, they, they, they found it strange. Uh, but my parents encouraged me, especially my mum. And my mum is an avid reader. Mm -hmm. So w if I find a book, I'll give it to her and I say, read about it. And, you know, she really encouraged me to, uh, to pursue that dream. But my parents, especially my mum, I uh, was very open-minded, and that's, that, that's also what encouraged me. Mm. Lessons from your travels. Um, what's the farthest you've been? W which country? Um, New Zealand. Okay. Yes, the farthest I've been. I've been to Auckland in New Zealand. Auckland is the second, no, the, the largest city mm -hmm. in New Zealand. That's the farthest I've been. Okay, of course, there's Christchurch as yes, well. Yes, that's yeah. the, yeah. Okay. Um, so... Far away from home, they have, um, so you've got the Maoris and yes, then you the also Maoris, have the Caucasian. Yes. Uh, um, 
What are some of the things that you have seen in your travels as far as humanity is concerned that makes you feel that, oh, you know, at the core of it all, we're all the same? Or what are the marked differences mm -hmm. you see on your travels? I think it's a mixture of both. Uh, because everywhere I've been, you know, I've realized people are the same everywhere. We have the same fears. You know, we, you know, we have the same dreams, desires. We want to be healthy. We want to be married. We want to have children. We want to have a good job, a good life and uh, we all have these same desires whether is the man living in uh, you know a 10 bedroom mansion or somebody living by the streets we all have these um, uh, these desires another thing that I have experienced throughout these 73 countries is the kindness of humanity Wow oh yes I thought Ghana was the only hospitable no, place to be no no that's a lie <laughs> <laughs> oh wow <laughs> sorry to best your bubble people but uh, because um, in Guinea, for example, mm. I was on a uh, on the bus going uh, from Conakry uh, to a, a town in the north of, of Guinea, and um, we, we had some issues on the on the on the vehicle. And ba basically, I had nowhere to to stay because all my the money that I had, you know, was taken, uh, you know, by the gendarmerie. That I think that's okay. a story for another mm. um, time. Um, and I told the lady that, listen, I've run out of cash and I don't have any money. And she actually said I should come and spend the night with her. Somebody I met just on the bus, moving from one, you know, part to the next. Um, and I've had that, I've experienced that kind of kindness. Another example is uh, flying from Washington, D.C. I was going to... Uh, no, actually flying from Toronto to Vancouver. Mm -hmm. This was in 2013. I met a lady on the plane called Polly, and she actually said I should, I should come and, you know, stay in her house. Yes, just on the flight. Um, and so many different people have either given me food to eat. Um, another story that really comes to mind is a guy I met in Zurich. Now, when I was in Zurich, I was on my last leg of the journey. I'd run out of time <clears throat> and money, more especially. And I needed to go to Vienna because that's where I was catching my plane from to come back to Accra. Um, but I had, my money was really running out. And I think I had just about 80 euros. And so I needed to get a bus. But when I got to a bus station, I realized that the buses are only twice a week. Wow. And so I, you know, there was no way I could get there except by train or fly. So I got talking to two gentlemen and I just said I was so disappointed because I needed to get to Vienna um, in a day's time. And the guy just looked at me and he gave me a ticket. So I, I, I said, I said, a ticket for me that, yes, that's a train ticket for you. Take it to Vienna. So I, I stood there. I was shocked. And I said, a ticket, you know, why are you giving me a ticket? You know, are you not going to use it? Then he told me his story. He said he was actually going to use it because he was going all the way to Sofia in Bulgaria. Right. But before he started his trip, um, he, he had lost his job and he had told all his friends that he was looking for a job. And somebody just called him saying that he had found him a job in Italy and his ticket was not going to Italy because that was in the opposite direction. It was supposed to go to Vienna. So he gave me, and the ticket, guess what? Was 120 euros. <laughs> talk about serendipity, <laughs> yeah? Yes. You know, but you, you, know, you talk about the, the, the kindness of humankind across the globe. Um, I'm sure that you've had incidents that also <laughs> didn't show <laughs> kindness all the time. Uh, can you recount some of them? And, and how does that make you feel when you recount that kind of an incident <laughs> compared to some of the kindness that you've experienced? Experience. I would say that, um, for example, sometimes I have a lot of challenges at the borders, uh, depending on which country I'm visiting and what they're thinking. And um, I've actually been thought to be a drug dealer before and wow. searched like one, not just once or twice, but okay. three times. And interestingly, um, New Zealand was a place where I, I, I had a hard time entering because, you know, they thought, you know, who is this? And, you know, the immigration official asked me that, why are you coming to New Zealand for a week? Mm. I said, well, I've been in Australia for three weeks. That who comes from? I mean, Ghana is so far away. Yeah. And so you've while traveled, you're there, you exactly, might as well. <laughs> might as well. <laughs> And so, so th things like that. But, you know, I've learned to, to just take it all in in my stride because in life, uh, stuff happens. There are good things and there are bad things. But in every circumstance, in every situation, I've always uh, looked at the brighter side of things. How did you come to hold on to a brighter side? Are you generally an optimistic person or 
uh, over time you develop this thick skin? I think it's a bit of, of, of both. Okay. I'm optimistic and oh yeah, over time I've developed a tough skin because I know that look, whatever it is, I would rise above it or I'll, I'll get over it. You know, typically um, on, on this show, we tend to talk to business people, artists and things. We've never had an explorer. And, and I have to be honest with you that uh, on a number of occasions so far, I've lost the trend of my thinking uh, because I'm, you know, thinking about all these wonderful places that you've seen. You talked about, you know, that sometimes it doesn't go so easy. Uh, it makes me remember, um, you know, a, a piece that um, the late Komla Dumont wrote about... <laughs> Traveling across Africa, this is when he started doing uh, the, the BBC Africa report, that we have this beautiful continent mm -hmm. and we have a few borders. Well, I mean, we've got borders mm -hmm. uh, bordering our 53 nations. Mm -hmm. uh, for some strange reason, it is so difficult to travel across the continent. How true is that? Oh. in your own experience because you've done what 30 or 31 okay. african countries i mean it's it's so true and it's frustrating because you i mean you're, you're frustrated because your own don't embrace you or receive you um and people in the west don't you know because to get a visa to any part of uh, the West or North America is quite difficult uh, too. It's extremely difficult to, to visit neighboring countries. I'll give a typical example. Um, I haven't been to Cameroon yet, but even though Cameroon is maybe two countries away, if I was going to go there, I would now have to look for the embassy, which would possibly be in Nigeria. So I'd have to travel to Nigeria and try and get uh, a visa from there. And that could take, you know, days. Or sometimes, you know, you, you don't even know the, the processes are not clear. Because if I, was, I could sit in Accra and apply for a Cameroonian visa, um, maybe online, then that would be easy to do. But it's, it's very difficult, extremely difficult. How do you think that holds, you know, um, puts an impediment in the way of other people who may have dreams of seeing the continent or traveling the world like you? I mean, even let's talk about business. That impedes our business to a large extent. Look at tourism. Assuming it was very easy for you to go to Lume. I mean, just effortlessly. I'm get so a happy border. you mentioned Lume because <laughs> I've had some very interesting experiences, experiences at the border. Yes. But if it was easy, um, on any holiday, you could, you, know, you could come with a family with your car mm. and say, let's go and have dinner in Lome and return the next day. But because of the impediments that you, know, you went through at the border, it would be the last thing you'd be thinking because you would really be hassled. Yeah. You know, I've been to Lome a number of times. Mm. And it's, it's not seamless. So for business, that, 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 that impedes our growth. And, you know, tourism, the movement of people. There are so many people, let's say in another country, maybe in Namibia, yeah. who are wanting to come to Ghana or Nigeria or go elsewhere. Um, and if the, they don't belong to, say, ECOWAS, because Southern Africa is SADC, SADC, That's then right. it's easier to move around. But in ECOWAS, if, if you have an ECOWAS passport, then it's a little bit easier at least to move between the 16 countries. Mm. But just think about this for a moment. If every country in Africa, the 54 countries in Africa, had no visa restrictions for Africans. I can tell you that tourism, trade, and businesses would just uh, blow up. Mm. We would all benefit because it would be easy to go to South Africa for a meeting I mean, if you had a meeting in South Africa, say in two weeks' time, you possibly may not be able well, to... Well, it takes two weeks just for the processing exactly of the visa. Exactly, so. the visa. So you would miss it. Hmm. But you could just get up and, and, and go. Let's, let's contrast that with travel across. I mean, the, Europe has, the EU has touted the whole Schengen concept. Mm -hmm. um, what's it like? Of course, if you had to go to Vienna and you were in Zurich, that mm -hmm. means that you're in the Schengen territory. Mm -hmm. How easy yeah. is it to move from Switzerland into Austria? It's... it's I mean, some sometimes actually to be honest you actually realize you're in another country when you arrive at the train station so you start off from maybe Zurich and you know you wake up um, at, in Vienna Hauptbahnhof that's when you know you are in Vienna sometimes uh, you're not even searched you know there are no stops yeah. it depends on the time of travel because I've been traveling and I've been stopped because a different uh, border post, sometimes immigration police would come on the train. But apart from that, you don't get down, you know, you don't have any of this. So moving about is seamless, it's effortless. 
Um, that's why you generally find Europeans, uh, you know, from you get up from Italy, you can have breakfast in Italy and have lunch in Switzerland mm. and possibly have lunch, uh, dinner in Germany. It's or possible. France, if yes, you're depending or, on who, yes, who, where, where you find going. yourself. Exactly. Yeah. That's interesting. And I, I, I like that you talk about the ease of movement um, mm -hmm. across uh, Europe. Mm -hmm. I've had the opportunity of experiencing mm -hmm. a bit mm -hmm. of it. Um, you know, just got on the train mm -hmm. in uh, Basel and mm -hmm. just went across into, I think it was Freiburg, mm -hmm. to, to shop and come back, come back. over a few hours. Uh, so really, while I'm spending money in Basel, I made time to go and also contribute to the German yeah. economy. Mm -hmm. So it's clear that if we can find ways to flatten our borders mm -hmm. and allow more movement, mm -hmm. then it could stimulate uh, the African economy as a whole and will benefit. You Without know. a doubt. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. We're going to take a short break. When we come back, I would like to learn more about your travels and uh, the philosophy behind uh, the nations you've experienced. I mean, people say, yeah, the, at the core of development is leadership. Is it truly about leadership? Is it the uniqueness and the mm -hmm. culture of the people? We'll explore all of that in a moment. This is the Executive Lounge. We'll be right back. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shira Addo and my guest, Princess Umu Hatia Mahama, the Mad Duck. Now, if you're wondering uh, why she's the mad duck and you just joined us, it's because she decided that she wants to travel across the entire globe. She wants to see every country and learn about the people and their culture. She's done 73 so far, and she's been sharing her insights with us. So make sure you stay tuned and learn some more about this intriguing personality. I know just before we went off, you've talked extensively about you know, the things you've learned around the world and that at the core of it all, that we're all the same. Mm -hmm. We have the same fears, we have the same desires and things like that. But look, if we all have the same fears, then really we should all be developed around the same uh, level. But there are some countries that are far more developed than others. So you've seen uh, places where things work mm -hmm. uh, and you've seen places where things don't work. Mm -hmm. uh, should we as Ghanaians be grateful for where we are or we should desire to punch above our weight? Wow, I mean, <laughs> definitely we could do more mm. as a nation. Uh, because I'll, I'll, I'll give you know, so many examples, but let's just say Singapore. Mm. Um, 60 years ago, Singapore was dirty. You know, been, I've, I've been to Singapore four times, um, and it's hard to even imagine that the country used to be dirty. You, you, it's hard, to, how are you going to imagine it when you see how far they have come? Um, and it's just because the right leaders and the people, because development I've come to observe, is not just about leadership, mm. it's also about the people. Um, the leaders wanted to do the right thing and they made sure that everybody had to toe the line. Um, and these are some of the things that we lack um, as a people. Um, if you look at Japan, after the, the Second World War, they were basically struggling. Um, I've been to Japan as well, Osaka and Tokyo, but now look at where Japan um, is. So it's, it's leadership and also a certain uh, mindset. And another example is Rwanda. I've mm. been to Rwanda. Um, but when I look at how, for example, clean Kigali is, uh, and I've actually been outside Kigali because I went to Uganda, so I got to Gatuna, that's uh, the border between Uganda and uh, Rwanda. Mm -hmm. um, and it's, it was clean all the way to that place, so not just in Kigali. Um, the leadership have a certain mindset and are making sure that everybody toes the line. These are some of the... Well, you, you know, I'm happy you talk about Singapore. Mm -hmm. um, it was not done with ease. Mm -hmm. um, and like you said, it requires a certain balance of uh, a desire by leadership, um, enforcement, and also uh, a mindset of the people. Mm -hmm. Let's bring this experience home. Mm -hmm. Ghana once was clean. Today mm -hmm. we're struggling with mm -hmm. uh, filth mm -hmm. to the extent that we have a whole ministry that's meant yeah. to just take care of sanitation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's another unprecedented innovation on our part. Mm -hmm. But 
do we or have we sold the vision clearly enough? Um, I mean, if people desire good things, mm -hmm. then the average Ghanaian, by that assertion, mm -hmm. would desire to live in a clean city mm -hmm. or a clean country. Mm -hmm. So where's the disconnect? Why do we have the challenges we have on our hands? Two things. Um, we, we fail to understand that development is not easy. I think the lie we have been sold is that, you know, because, of, because we're independent, um, things are going to fall into place. But development must be systematic. It's not haphazard. Mm. And looking at, uh, I've been to Madagascar. I mean, one of the poorest countries in the world and also one of the dirtiest countries in the world. And to think that Madagascar with such unique flora and fauna, I mean, Madagascar has some trees and birds that you don't find anywhere else in the world. Oh, so. we'll be, yes, we'll be struggling uh, with that. So I think that, that that's, that's, that's the disconnect. Another problem we have is law enforcement. You know, in Ghana, you are not punished for doing anything. Well, maybe if you're a good thief, you'll be punished. Mm. But if you, you know, you are a proper thief, who you wouldn't be punished. Mm. If you jump a red light, you would not be punished. Or maybe you'll be stopped. But if you give five CDs, ten CDs, you'll be allowed to pass. So because we are not punished for wrongdoing, there isn't an incentive to do right. Because if we really want to get the filth off our streets, then it means that when you drink pure water, you cannot throw it, the rubbish away. And if you are found, you should be punished. And if you are punished, that will be a deterrent. Because sometimes, you know, we may want good things, but we have developed bad habits that make good things repeal, uh, you know, away from us. I'm very glad that you talked about Singapore. My very first time of hearing about Singapore was, I think, in 1990, when a friend of our family did travel there for about three months, and he came back, and he started talking about how they are very beautiful buildings. But the most important thing that he said was that, it was very clean, you couldn't litter, you couldn't do some of the things that we used to do and get away with over here, because if you did, I mean, I couldn't fathom that someone was paid to whip you if you dropped litter. This was in 1990. Now, around that same time here in Ghana, I think we had uh, Salifu Amankwa at Circle, who was also doing certain things, uh, enforcing you know, that you couldn't. If you walked across, you got caned and, and things like that. But somehow, our entire society, or there was a very loud chorus that says, no, that shouldn't happen. That's a, an abuse of human rights and things like that. Did we miss something in our own development? Uh, did we, like you said, it's not going to be easy, but I mean, did we decide that we would spare the rod and spoil the child well, being that, the nation? Well, that's exactly what we've done. Um, but should we cane people, though? Maybe not cane people, but there should be a fine to pay. Mm. Uh, there should be a fine to pay. Not cane people, but there should be a fine to pay. And the fine um, should be in such a way that it won't go into an individual's pocket. Because in our part of the world, that's what happened. Even if there is a penalty, um, somebody ends up, you know, maybe, you know, taking it. And another thing I have observed is that, look, in Sharia, this, th this is hard, but I'll say it. We have a lot of undercurrents in our society. I'll give a few examples. The undercurrent of tribalism, mm -hmm. the undercurrent of religion, mm -hmm. the undercurrent of chieftaincy, the undercurrent of politics. Um, so say you are a member of my party. Mm -hmm. Let's just assume I've set up a mad duck party. Yeah. You are a member. You litter and you're supposed to be punished. And because you know me and I'm influential, I'd go to the police and ask that you should be released. And that's exactly what is done. But what has happened is I have set a bad precedent. Anybody who chose litter would not be punished. Or even if they are punished, one chief, one friend, one former schoolmate, one politician, one assembly man would come and plead for the person. And the person would be, would be left to go. So is this a failure of leadership or the people? Both. It's a fit because we need... Who brings more pressure? Because there are only a few people in leadership, <laughs> you know, uh, and, and it's the leader who gets called. And I think in our cultural context, uh, like you said, I mean, you know, a chief, you know, the family elder, a classmate, and we're very loyal and communal people. So it's very easy that, oh, I'm in trouble, so who do I call? It places a certain moral pressure on the person. Should we stop calling people? We should stop calling people. And if we get called... 
Well, we should say do the right thing. That, mm. That's what it is. But you see, you need to have a certain mindset. And this mindset is about seeing the big picture. Let me give a typical example. Sure. Assuming, uh, you, you know, you, you didn't learn how to drive the correct way, mm -hmm. but you managed to get a license. Um, and I gave the license to you. I work in the license office. Um, if I was seeing the big picture of the impact of, say, accident on our roads, mm. on locals, as well as, because if there's so many accidents on our roads, tourists would not come and they definitely wouldn't um, rent vehicles because their lives would be at risk. If I just even think of that alone, I would not want to give you the license without you having the, uh, gone through the, the accurate uh, channel. But one thing we fail to see always is the big picture. It's about if I, if I let you go now, but the big picture would be if I let you go now, our streets would continue to be filled with rubbish. And in five, ten years time, you know, we'd have mount hills, uh, mountains and more hills of rubbish in our cities and out. That is the big picture. And that's one thing we fail to do. How do we fix this? Everyone says the big elephant in the room is politics. Um, from police recruitment, I mean recruitment into all our security agencies, to getting people jobs in the public service. Politics is now the bad guy messing everything up. <laughs> so how can we fix this? By just be saying no. And you see a lot of us, you know, just because of our, our cultural setting, we, we, we hate to be called uh, a mean person. We, you know, we, we want to please well, it's everybody. A nice, it's a nice feeling to be called Well, but mean. if you think big picture, mm. you wouldn't mind being called a mean person. I'll give a typical example. You know, something like, uh, 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 an example that comes to mind is, say, Manasseh Azure and mm -hmm. the work he does. Mm -hmm. You know, he's lambasted every single day. Yeah. Every single day he's lambasted. But it's because he has developed a thick skin and it's not that the things he is promoting, they would benefit us as a society. So, and these are things you just have to deal with. You know, I'm glad you said this, but you see, let me, um, let, let, let's just juxtapose that mm -hmm. narrative uh, with the United States, for mm -hmm. example. Um, it is very evident that in spite of being Republican or Democrat, there's a common agenda. That's because there was a certain vision. Have we, in your travels and expertise, uh, have we galvanized behind a specific vision? Because that's how the big picture is painted. Unfortunately, uh, I mean, <laughs> I don't want to say we are visionless, but you know, what's the vision of Ghana? I, I have no clue. Freedom and justice. <laughs> <laughs> You know, every political party oh, the, oh, comes... Oh, the gateway to Africa. <laughs> oh, really? <laughs> I've been to 31 countries and I don't think it's the gateway. Mm. Um, but we, we need a vision. We need a, definitely need a vision. But you see, we need... Another thing we're very good at doing is talking without action. Oh. You know, everything is about talking. But I just read something recently that, that, that buttressed what I've always known is that a person who is doing has little time or no time to talk. Because if we have 24 hours in the day and you're using that to work or improve uh, whether your community or your own life, you don't have time to be talking. So you'd have to stop working and then talk. And that's one thing we're very, we talk about everything, but we don't put in the real measures to bring about, and I mean real change. We don't. Let's talk a bit about, of course, in, in the, on these travels, you would consume um, the media in, in these places you go to. Let's give me a sense of what the media is like outside of our country and in some of the places you've been. What role does it play mm -hmm. um, in, in the development paradigm? Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, and then the, you talk about, you know, talking. The media talks, writes, paints. I mean, mm -hmm. how different is the media from Ghana when you travel? I would say that um, in other parts of the world, when the media, you know, because you are punished for wrongdoing, you know, when the media highlights an issue, um, it's drilled deep and then we've, okay, who did the wrong thing? And that person is sacked. 
And so when, you know, the media acts as a, a, a light post or highlights things, but the root causes are dealt with. Mm. And whoever is involved is whether sacked or jailed or whatever. But here, because we don't have a system whereby people are punished. Oh, yes, yeah, sorry, we do have a system, but the system is never enforced. So the media highlights things that are happening, but nobody's sacked. Nobody's removed. You know, there can be an accident and a thousand people will die. Nobody would be sacked. Because assuming uh, the investigation was drilled down to one person, um, you know, if he knows a chief or maybe me, you know, he would come and speak mm. to me and I would go and say, listen, don't jail him, free him. You know, I'm glad you talked about this in the system and no one is sacked and all of that. But um, are we an honorable people? And I ask this because <laughs> you've been, I ask this because you've been to uh, Japan and it's the one country that has remained top four uh, economy for as long as I can remember mm -hmm. uh, but they go through um, what do you call it prime ministers faster than Chelsea has sacked <laughs> its coaches mm -hmm. what about the Japanese make them I mean what can we learn from the Japanese that people died in a tsunami mm -hmm. that the man at the Fukushima plant had nothing to do with but he resigned. Yes. You know, the Japanese really think generational. I'll give an example. Um, in Japan, when a person is loyal to, say, a particular business, mm. they just make sure that their children, children's children are loyal to it. But if they also understand that we are in a developing stage or I, I'm not able to wear shoes, mm -hmm because I have to walk barefooted, but for five years, and in 20 years, my children will be able to wear shoes. They will do it. So the Japanese generally are sacrificial, and they're sacrificial with a big picture. Mm. But in our parts, no. If I say, you know, because of X, Y, Z, you know, start walking, you would refuse. Mm. And that's just, an ex I mean, that's just one example. But in Japan, they, they think about the well-being, their well-being, as a whole, but we think of well-being as a silo. So I'm thinking of my well-being and my children and my... Of it, course. <laughs> I was barbed wire all over it, big dogs in the house and all and of that. And by the way, Japan is one of the safest countries in this world. Really? I mean, theft is basically non-existent because they believe in the law of karma and they believe that if you steal any, any property of anyone or... You know, it, you, you would pay for it. So wow. in Japan, you can lose your wallet on a train. It will be found with the money in it. Okay, I'm gobsmacked. Uh, look, let's take a break <laughs> at this point. But uh, you know what? Just, just before the break, uh, let me just squeeze it in. Uh, the, the, the concept of honor, as you've seen it in the Japanese culture, and the fact that more and more people is part of their culture, <laughs> it didn't happen by chance what have you learned that they did to ensure that generations are constantly living by this code i mean what if, what can we do differently if we have to change our own paradigm see the big picture in but how do you how do you get your children to see the big picture how do we get the entire population to see the big picture by modeling it you have to, because you have to model. You know, like they say, children are always learning, whether you are teaching them or not. And children learn by modeling. So you be that example. If you don't want to see rubbish, you don't throw um, rubbish on the floor. You, don't, you want to do the right thing. Don't call a person and say, look, I'm in trouble. Go and bail me out. And you teach your children. That's how we will do. So the leadership must model it. Let me just talk about discipline mm -hmm. or being on time. Mm -hmm. We attend functions and 99.99% of the time, the functions start late. The president or head of uh, uh, whoever it is, m most likely would come late. The public servant. <laughs> the public servant <laughs> we, we know, comes would, late. Would come late. Mm. What have you told us? What we're doing is not important. Time is not important because in other developed countries where presidents or, you know, people are the head of whether government or in organizations are busier, they make it a point to come on time. They are modeling timeliness. So then, of course, when you come after me, as you mean, I was a president, I'll ask you, why are you late? I am busier than you and I'm here. Mm. But if you come late, you've just told everybody that, well, being early or being on time 
It's not important. Is it about being conscientious or it's just that? I mean, because the same people who are late to functions are never late to board their first class yes, flights. Yes, flights. Yeah. So I, I, I really, it's a mindset, mm. you know, but think about it. If we are penalized for being late or whatever it is, I don't know, very recently, about two weeks ago, um, one, I can't remember his name, in Theresa May's government was yes, actually yes, late. Yes, 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 you know, to, and parliament, to parliament, and he resigned. And he handed in his resignation for being late. And mm. maybe he was, what, 30 minutes late? But Theresa May said she wasn't going to accept that lateness and understood that he never come. But... Can you imagine that happening here? That a member of parliament is resigning. Because, because I failed he, to show up. Yes, he was late. <laughs> that will be the day. <laughs> Listen, let's take a break. Uh, we'll be back with more. This is the Executive Lounge, and I am having a great time with the Mad Duck Princess, Umu Hatia Mahama. Stay tuned. More coming up. Welcome back to the Executive Lounge with me in Shira Ado and my guest, Princess Umu Hatia Mahama. She's supposed to be called the Mad Duck. And uh, I, I've just thoroughly enjoyed, you know, the conversation so far. I learned a lot. Now, our continent. Some people refer to it as the Dark Continent. <laughs> uh, you've seen 31 out of the 54 nations. Is it dark? Um, well, I think that it's, I would say that's a, a double-edged question. Um, Africa is beautiful. Mm. I mean, from Ethiopia to Namibia to South Africa, uh, the seas, the rivers, the mountains. I was in Zanzibar in Tanzania, the island mm -hmm. of, and it's one of the most beautiful places I've ever seen. Wow. So we have beautiful places and we have beautiful people. But I'll say that sometimes our actions are not beautiful, to be honest. Um, our actions are not beautiful sometimes. Wow. So what what you like traveling you're an explorer but i'm sure inside there there's stuff that you're equally passionate about well what else are you passionate about i'm passionate about teaching mm. uh, because all the things that i have learned over the years and seen you know one way of helping in the transformation of our continent um, is by sharing um, my ideas mm. but i'm also passionate about writing and that's why I've written um, Adventures of the Mad Duck uh, for both adults and children. Oh, wow. Yes. How many books have you written so far? I've written seven books so far. Wow. Yes. But I've just written um, three books for children to also um, help them to dream, but also share some of the, the stories or things that I have seen. Mm -hmm. And that way we can definitely uh, influence our country and our continent for good. Africa indeed is beautiful. You've traveled not just across the continent, but you've seen pretty much, what, 73 countries and counting. I'm sure you'll be jetting off to another one soon. But our lives are a sum total of the experiences we've had. Mm -hmm. How has the travels either cemented the values you hold dear or changed them? Um, I think that it's, it's done a bit of both mm. because you read and learn that human beings are the same everywhere you go. But actually experiencing it, I'm clear that human beings are the same um, everywhere you go. And also, I had uh, or you, I had some stereotypes about different people, mm -hmm. uh, whether it's you know people in North Africa, for example. I mean, my first visit when I went to Morocco 11 years ago, I was shocked um, to see Moroccan women dressed elegantly, you know, with they've tied their hair and all of them, but with makeup, um, and I was really surprised. That was 11 years ago? Yes, 11 years. They dress, so I saw them too. <laughs> I, think about I went to Marrakesh uh, a couple of years ago. Okay. Um, and, and I think I see, you know, that the, I went with the same kind of stereotype. Mm -hmm. That, okay, so this is an Islamic nation, so, you know, everyone would be in a burqa. Mm -hmm. But it's very modern. Yes. You know, what other stereotypes did you have of other places and, you know, not forgetting that, how has that impacted on your own value system? Um, maybe some other stereotypes was about how people thought, because maybe I used to think that, you know, people in North Africa or in 
or in Europe, you know, they have a they 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 think differently. And even though they think differently, the underpinning what I see is that human beings are the same, mm. and we allow ourselves to think in a particular way. So, in a developed country, the country is developed because not 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 people not not because uh, people are more intelligent than say us, but it's because they have chosen to think in a certain way that have brought about that development. Because before I started, um, another thing was I was so hopeful, to be honest. Um, I was hopeful that, you know, some countries in Africa would truly break the back of poverty and corruption and um, all of this. But the longer I'm traveling, I, I'm losing that hope. And maybe I'm, I'm relying wow. on, on insurance hope to carry on because I see the patterns we have in Ghana. I've seen them in almost all the 31 countries in Africa I've visited, whether it's corruption, whether it's not seeing the big picture, being selfish and all, not taking responsibility. That's another big thing um, I have seen. So sometimes, uh, you know, they, they, these are the things I would, yeah, I would. Uh, wow. Um, you travel for fun and for learning and all of that, but what do you do to relax? <laughs> I, I'm, I, I have difficulty asking that question because I'm imagining travel to be a fun thing, which is something you do to relax. But I mean, apart from that, what do you do to relax? Um, what do I do? I read, to be honest. Yeah, reading really relaxes me. Mm. And I like to exercise as well, um, that relax. But I, reading really relaxes me and travel, um, obviously. Learning generally relaxes me. So I like to learn. How do you couple being a, you know, a, a, an explorer, <laughs> an adventurer with managing your brood of five daughters and a family? <laughs> You know, when you, you would normally think that I'm on the road all the time. Mm -hmm. No, that's not the case. I'll generally travel for two months in a year, uh, but those two months would be quite intensive. So when I travel, you know, I'd visit all neighboring countries. Um, and the children, you know, and, and my husband as well, they haven't died whilst I've been away. Um, <laughs> they have coped. I think that is really important for our children to realize that parents work, mm -hmm. and even more so for our girl, uh, our girl children. Um, that our mothers are working. So they can also grow up with that mindset. Just like I said earlier on, children are always learning, whether you are teaching them or not. So the children will grow up understanding that women, you know, they work, they, are, they can travel, and they, they can leave their families, and they would come and find them um, safe. Mm. So that's how I, I manage. But I am a planner. Um, I really plan everything that I do. The things I do, they, they may sound simple, uh, but they, they are not quite simple. Did, did you plan to have five, <laughs> five daughters? <laughs> I'll even have more. You know, all our children are adopted, um, and we intend to even have many, many more children. Fantastic. So I'm not halfway there yet. Wow, that's, that's <laughs> beautiful to learn. Let's, uh, as we wrap uh, this uh, excellent um, uh, interaction up, I'd like to know what your thoughts or your desires for the future are. Wow, um, I have many desires, but you know, for Africa, um, sometimes I, you know, I, I want to run away, <laughs> basically, but I really dream that we as a people will take responsibility of our lives and of our nations. Mm. And we won't wait for the next person to help us because all the solutions reside with us mm -hmm. so that's really my you know one of my biggest dreams i also dream that an, Af an africa that will be borderless where like i said before all the 54 countries in africa would have basically no borders and i know eu uh, sorry AU, au is yeah. working on it mm -hmm. uh, they have an african passport where they intend to roll out in 2019 but i just pray it's not one of those talk shops uh, because a lot of times we have good intentions uh, but they just remain talk shops mm -hmm. and they never materialize. So it's really my desire that um, I see the AU do that. And also for Ghana, you know, mm -hmm. I, I want to see a clean Ghana, mm -hmm. a Ghana free from corruption, a Ghana free from undercurrents of tribalism or politics um, or chieftaincy and all of that. A Ghana where people who really merit a thing 
will get it without knowing anybody or calling the next person. A Ghana that's truly free and fair. A Ghana where people can truly achieve their dreams, mm. whether they're in sports, in entertainment, whether they're artists, whether they're authors, doctors, lawyers, um, business people. A Ghana where uh, would all be proud mm. to say, we are Ghanaians. I share in that dream. It's a very beautiful one if we can achieve it. And uh, thank you so much. It's been amazing. And uh, I must say that if this is just uh, uh, learning so much under an hour, it would be even more fun reading all those seven books. So uh, for you, the viewers, um, this is not a plug, but it's, it's a, uh, I think it's something you should do. Find the book and, uh, and, and read it, you know, uh, because there's so much more you'll learn uh, from, from this mad duck. Princess Umu Hatia Mahama, thank you so much uh, for making time for us on the Executive Lounge. The pleasure has been absolutely mine. Thank you for having me. Awesome. So here are my five takeouts. Number one, plan. And uh, Princess talks about having to go through maps, read about places you wanted to see. If you don't plan, then you are not interested in being successful at what you do. Number two is that think big. Your actions have an impact on the next person, and guess what? On the next generation. And in line with doing things with the next generation in mind, remember that the younger people will model what the older people do. So when you're setting examples, make the precedent one that ensures that we're progressing as a people, not just developing and uh, doing new great things, but more importantly, that we're developing and evolving a certain mindset that protects the heritage that we have and advances our culture in a positive light. The fourth thing, don't think in a box. In fact, think like there's no box because uh, she's nurtured the idea of seeing every nation on the world and she's seen 73. There's still more to go. Hopefully you've also been inspired and you'll do more. And the final thing for me is that just don't stop, you know, uh, keep going because the Journeys have not always been rosy, but at the end of it all, there's a silver lining if you look for it. So go forward, make rain, shalom. It's been awesome coming your way. When we come back next week, we'll have another interesting conversation for you. Thank you to the entire team. More importantly, thank you for tuning in. We'll be back next week.